Hello, folks! It's me again, Amanda Enderman, your trusty tour guide in the wonders of the wonderful city, also known as Rio de Janeiro. And, well, you can see that, uh, firstly, you can see that I'm back to recording in my room instead of recording in the living room. And, well, my friends, that is because there's some serious renovation going on in the apartment next to mine, so the noise oftentimes is really bad for filming. And, well, in my room, the sound isolation is much, much better. So, for now, we're gonna be recording here until the renovation is done. Oh, and also, not forgetting to mention that I am offering walking tours here in Rio and those tours are described in detail on my website, which the link will be on the description box below as well as on the first fixed comment. So I hope that you will go there as well and check it out and you can contact me on WhatsApp, make your reservations and let's get to know the city of Rio in in person. I can't wait to show the wonders of the wonderful city for you myself in person. But other than that, on this video I'm gonna talk about a theme which actually is a part two, as you probably guessed by the title, you know, Enlightening Rio part two, because this was the continuing of the project by Dom Juan VI to develop Brazil culturally. And in case you're new to this channel and you haven't seen this video yet and you have no idea what I'm talking about, I am gonna leave the link here for my previous video where I talked about the French artistic mission which was the first step in enlightening Rio and also developing Brazil culturally. So I will leave the link up here for you to see after you watch this video. Well, he had this project of developing Brazil culturally ever since he arrived here. And once again, I have mentioned how he came to live here and moved here and etc. in another video that I've already made, which is called Welcoming the Gentry in Rio, which I will also leave the cards for you up here. For those of you who are new to this channel, obviously. Those of you who are already accompanying my videos, you know what I'm talking about. So, the thing is, folks, that with this mission, which actually, it wasn't an artistic mission, it was actually more of a scientific mission, if you will, because on this mission there weren't painters or sculptors or what have you, no, there were naturalists as they would call it back then. Well, nowadays we would call them botanists, we would call them perhaps zoologists or biologists even, but back then they were just referred to as naturalists. And hence the text that I've put right here on the screen. Uh, incidentally, here come the naturalists. This is why. But most importantly, they came along with a very important historical figure of Brazil, not only of Rio, but also of Brazil, which also, along with José Bonifácio Andrade Silva, was the one responsible for orchestrating the process of Brazil's actual independence from Portugal, which was none other than dun, 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 Empress Leopoldine. Yes, our very first Empress, but of course, in this particular time in history, when she came here with this mission in order to get married to then Prince Dom Pedro IV, in Portugal, he was the fourth of his name, but here in Brazil, it's the first. Back then, she was an Archduchess of Austria, and she was also just 20 years old. Oh, and by the way, I'm recording this video on September 3rd, and exactly four days from now, on September 7th, is the 200th anniversary of Brazil's independence, my friends! Yes! It has been 200 years since Brazil stopped being a colony of Portugal! Yay! And, well, there have been news all over the city of Rio. That in the city of Rio alone, there will be three days of celebrations starting on the 6th of September, you know, 
Uh, and in all major cities of Brazil and the small cities as well, there will be celebrations because it's not every day that you celebrate 200 years of being an independent country. And as you can see, I can barely contain my excitement of being alive to watch this. And I know I'm extending myself here, but do you know what this means? I mean, the last time something like this happened was 100 years ago. I think my grandpa was alive at the time, you know, but not even my father was alive at the time, you know, in 1922. And in the next one, a hundred years from now, very likely I won't be here anymore. But okay, let me take a breather so that I can come back to focus. Okay, focus, Amanda, focus. So now, without further ado, let me introduce you to our beloved Empress, though in this point in time she was still an Archduchess of Austria, Leopoldine of Austria. And here she is, my friends. This over here is Archduchess Leopoldine of Austria and future Empress Leopoldine of Brazil. My goodness, there are countless videos about her on YouTube, all singing her praises, of course, because she was phenomenal. It goes without saying. Austrians watching this video, I'm sure you know how phenomenal she was, but just in case for the rest of the people who don't know, or just in case there aren't enough videos talking about her in English, allow me to sing her praises as well on this channel. It's the least I can do. She's one of the people responsible for my country being an independent country. So, well, she was very intelligent. Her IQ was like in the stratosphere. But all of this intelligence, of course, was encouraged and blossomed through a very good education. Good old-fashioned Habsburg education, to be exact. Because as I mentioned before in the video welcoming the gentry in Rio, unlike courts like the Braganza court, which were more old-fashioned and only educated the eldest son in the ex expectation of being a ruler, in courts like the Habsburg court, all of the children were educated in the expectation that they would rule one day. So they all were taught things like politics, international relations, diplomacy, and all of that, along with other subjects such as, you know, how to comport yourself in court playing the harpsichord and foreign languages. So she was given the same education that any prince in his own right would have been given. And she thrived in it. It was like putting a seed in the most fertile soil that you can imagine. Because, you see, she played the harpsichord, which at the time there wasn't piano yet, it was harpsichord, but she played the harpsichord like a professional. She excelled as well in horseback riding and in politics, diplomacy, and etc. By the way, in case you're wondering, oh, but Amanda, the independence is so close and you're not gonna make a video about the independence. Calm down, calm down. We are going to get there eventually, but still we are in the year 1817, which was when all of this that I'm narrating happened. So we still have five years to go before we reach five years of history, that is. I'm not gonna take five years to get there, not to worry. <laughs> but um, we still have a little to go before we get to Brazil independence but of course I will make a video about Brazil's independence anyways going back to her one of her favorite subjects was the natural sciences mineralogy and she would have been a very accomplished botanist and a naturalist as well in fact when she was already here in Brazil, already married to Dom Pedro I, while being heavily pregnant, that is like seven or eight months pregnant, she would go on horseback all the way from São Cristóvão until Santa Cruz, which nowadays from Catete, where I live, to Santa Cruz, you have to take a subway and the train and it's a two hour long ride. And mind you, there's no traffic when it comes to subways and trains. Without traffic and going at the speed of a subway and the train, it's two hours long. So I believe from São Cristóvão until there, it would be an hour and a half or an hour long by subway and train. 
So imagine that on horseback and while being seven or eight months pregnant. But she would do that because it was a pastime of hers in order to catalog the different songs that the birds would sing. And she even made little music sheets with the songs so that it could be replicated on the harpsichord. That's how brilliant she was. Leopoldine, you rock. That's all I can say. Anyways, because she had such an interest in natural sciences, her father, the Emperor Francis I, I had to look at my notes here in order to remember, which is this gentleman over here, paid for this mission to go to Brazil. And this also had the purpose of strengthening the ties further between Brazil and Austria, which were already being cemented with the marriage between her and Dom Pedro IV of Portugal or the I of Brazil. And of course, Dom Jean VI loved the idea. So actually, she was also making the very smart move of pleasing her future father-in-law. Talk about being intelligent and smart. But moving on to the actual naturalists of this mission, the first of them that I brought here for you is this gentleman over here, which is Thomas Enda. And you may be noticing already a difference in my pronunciation of the name, because if you've already watched the video about the French artistic mission, I apologize in advance because I don't speak French. I realize that I might have messed up the pronunciations of all the names, but unlike French, I do speak quite a bit of German, though not enough of course, for me to make an entire video in German, naturally. Uh, vielleicht eines Tages kann ich es machen, aber noch nicht. So, translating, I said, maybe someday I'll be able to, but not yet. <laughs> Hopefully, that contributes to a more correct pronunciation of the names of the scientists. <laughs> Anyways, so Thomas Enda, his thing was painting with watercolors. And he used this in this mission in order to draw the things that he saw in Rio and in Sao Paulo. But the thing is that, quite different from the French artistic mission, this time around, as you can see in this, which is one of his paintings, nature was the focus of the paintings. It's still in the neoclassic style, so it is like you took a picture of the place, but instead of focusing on the urban landscape or even so much on nobles and etc., he is focusing on nature. Another interest of his was in the slaves and also on the, nas the different nationalities that the slaves originally came from. Though the one that actually very minutely categorized the different nationalities of the slaves was another of the scientists, which I will mention in just a little bit, but he also was very interested in them. No wonder that you can see in this picture, there are no masters. There are only the slaves working on this, which very likely was a plantation or something in the outskirts of Rio, which, well, it wasn't hard to go to the outskirts of Rio at the time, you know. As as I said before in the video Growing Apart in Rio, anything which wasn't the current downtown area until the of November Square and Lapa, anything that wasn't in that region, which is a very tiny region at that, was the outskirts of the city. So basically most of Rio was considered outskirts at the time. However, you can see that the slaves here are literally in the center of the painting and nature is the focus. You can see the city way there in the background, but it, it's nearly not there. As well as the church, which possibly belongs to the farm, the rural property in this case. But you know, the city and such with the Guanabara Bay is way in the, in the background. And this very much symbolizes this Austrian mission. Oh, and by the way, it wasn't only Austrian. Mind you, the artists also came from Italy, the different kingdoms that comprised Italy at this time, because, mind you, Italy had not yet been unified into one single country at this point, and the artists came from Bavaria as well. Similarly, Germany hadn't yet reunified and become what is known as the Second Reich. 
Think of a patchwork of principalities and tiny kingdoms. This is what Germany and Italy were at this point in time, in 1817. Anyways, the one that I was talking about, who actually very minutely cataloged the different ethnicities of Brazil, both regarding the natives as well as the African slaves, was this gentleman over here, which is Johan Moritz Hugendas. And we here in Brazil have to say a very hardly dankeschön to this uh, gentleman, you see, because it is thanks to him that we have drawings like this one over here, which, as you can see, are basically an encyclopedia of the different ethnic or, or sub-ethnic, I should say, groups. And when I say sub-ethnic, I don't know if this is the correct term, but what I mean is the, the subdivisions of the ethnic groups because of course these over here for instance are different types of natives existing here in brazil so the natives as a whole would be the ethnic group and then these different kinds would be subdivisions i don't mean that they were lower in any ways of course not <laughs> far be it from me but not only did he do that with the indigenous but he also did that with the African slaves, as you can see. And here it's even more precise because he wrote down the places where they were originally from under their drawing. And I hope this answers, at least partially, a question which tourists, especially foreign tourists, have asked me a lot along the years, which is where did the slaves actually come from? And here you can see a few of the places, such as Angola, such as Bengala, such as Congo. But to be more precise, they would come, of course, from the Portuguese colonies in Africa. So definitely Angola, definitely current Mozambique or current Cape Verde, those places. But, my friends, the thing with Johann Moritz Hugendas is that he was actually part of another mission which came here parallel to the Austrian mission, which was the mission by the Baron Georg Heinrich von Langsdorff. And this mission was actually a Russian mission. Yes. And Johann Moritz Hugendas came here with this mission as a spy. What is it with Russians and sending spies to places? For the life of me, I can't understand why. It's like they blink and they send spies to places. I mean, come on, man. And boy, would I know, as someone from a Latvian family, I know <laughs> how keen they are on sending spies to places. I know! Hmm. Uh, and I also know that the Russians, back in 1807, were making the phenomenal mistake of siding with Napoleon. And Russians watching this video, I know, I know, I owe you thanks for General Winter and the whole defeating Napoleon thing, so thank you for that. But you know as well as I do that you guys signed the Treaty of Tilsit it in 1807 with Napoleon, whose purpose was to end the Braganza dynasty. Hmm. Huh. Oh well, you were already thinking about ending dynasties in 1807, hmm? But anyways, of course, with this treaty, relations with Portugal were ended between Russia and Portugal, that is. So, naturally, Don Juan VI forbade anything Russian to come to Portugal or the Portuguese colonies, of course. What did you expect him to do, huh? <laughs> But, gladly, thank heavens, with time, the Russians saw the light, shall we say, and sent this mission saying, oh, well, he wants to enrich Brazil culturally as well, so we're sending a mission of our own with that purpose. But you had to send a spy to a diplomatic mission? Seriously? Well, Russians for you. This is the reason why this gentleman over here, Johann Moritz Hugendas, came here. <laughs> and well, folks, forgive me for being a little, you know, passionate about this, but it must be my Latvian side speaking. People that come from Eastern Europe, you know what I mean. <laughs> Our next scientist of this mission 
is actually the very first zoologist to explore the region of the Amazon jungle, which is in Brazilian territory, which is this young man over here, which is Johan von Spix. And the thing about him is that he didn't come from a wealthy family, so the way he made his way in the world was by entering the Episcopal School of Bunberg, that was actually in the Kingdom of Bavaria, not in Austria. And when he graduated in 1808, he was invited by the King Maximilian Joseph I to organize the Zoology Academy of Bavaria. So you can see how long of a way he came just by being intelligent and excelling at his field of knowledge. And actually, his work was so remarkable that further in time, in 1832, the scientist Johann Wagler incorporated his name into a Brazilian species, which is roughly translating from the popular name in Portuguese, the little blue macaw, and not to be confused with the actual blue macaw. They are different species, but the scientific name of the little blue macaw was originally Citasi spixi, and later it was changed to Cyanopsita spixi. And the spixi is in honor of Johann von Spix, as you can see. Oh, and by the way, I always forget this. This is another drawing of an animal from here, which he took back to Bavaria. Because you see, one of the main purposes of this mission was to not only draw or write about the specimens, but also actually take specimens back to Austria, Bavaria, or Russia, or what have you. And this over here, these are actual blue macaws. And for those of you who are remembering the movie Rio, yes, the two main characters in the movie Rio, Blue and Jade, they are blue macaws. But this isn't the species which I'm talking about, whose scientific name is Cyanopsita spixi. The Cyanopsita spixi is actually this bird over here, which this one is the one that's commonly known as the little blue macaw. You can see that it is similar, it's like a smaller version and the blue is less strong, but this is the one that was named after Johann von Spix. And he came along with Karl von Machius and he actually traveled through seven different Brazilian states taking notes of everything he saw, not only about the animals and nature itself, but also of the people that he encountered and as well as the customs that he encountered, just like the others. So Karl von Machius was this man over here, and he was the son of a pharmacist, though he chose to take up medicine. However, he didn't go on to practice medicine. Mm -mm. During his university years, he became a botanist. And in 1814, he was given the PhD with a thesis that served as a catalog for the botanical garden of Erlagen. So he studied the distribution of the Brazilian plants, the climate, and the distribution of the rivers in several regions. And this analysis resulted in the division of Brazil into what nowadays we call in Portuguese biomas, which basically is studying the different regions in regards to if they have a lot of rivers or if they're dry and their climate, if it's humid, if it's a desert-like climate, if it's in between, what kind of animals they have in each region, what kind of plants they have in each region. He was the one that first divided this. And to this day, mind you, in schools here in Brazil, we study geography just like that dividing Brazil in regions. This is a very important thing, especially when you're addressing foreign tourists, because you see, Brazil is a very big country. And unlike, for instance, Russia or the US, which are big like this, extending from east to west, Brazil is big, extending from north to south. So there are several different climates and 
types of natural landscape and all of that here. And this is actually a very common mistake that tourists make when they come here. I can't tell you how many times I have been asked, for instance, when is the rain season here in Rio? When actually here the climate doesn't work like that. Where the climate works like that is in the north, where the Amazon jungle is. And also, especially the tourists who go to the region of the Amazon Amazon jungle first, they expect it to be warm and humid all year long in all of Brazil, which mm -mm, don't make that mistake because it definitely isn't. Here in Rio, for instance, as I've said numerous times in several videos, it gets cold during winter, specifically in mid-May and mid-September. It gets cold so much so that I'm wearing a coat right now. Because, well, today it's not that cold, but it's not that warm either, to the point that I wouldn't need a coat. If you go to the north and or the northeast first, don't assume that it's gonna be equally warm all over the country. Please, don't make that mistake. You'll regret it. And we have Carl von Matthews to thank for this. <laughs> so once again, Danke schön, Herr Matthews. Oh, by the way, I always forget this. This is a drawing made by him, which as you can see, once again, nature is the emphasis over here. And what particularly is the emphasis here, this tree is actually a jackfruit tree. Last but definitely not least is this gentleman over here, which is Johann Natara. He was one of those, along with Johann von Spieks, who brought the most specimens back to Austria, in his case. And in fact, he brought such a big collection, including the drawings by Thomas Enda and Hugendas and Machius and what have you, that he was able to open a museum in Vienna, which is the Brazilian museum called Brasilianum. Austrians watching, once again, if such a museum still exists, please leave it down in the comments. Tell me about this museum in the comments. I'm gonna be very honest with you here. Until I researched about this mission, I had no idea that such a museum exists or existed, and now I would love to know more about it. And also, let's make this channel interactive. It's also good, so it's actually an excuse to make this channel interactive, because, of course, I could always research more, but let's make it interactive, you know? If you know about this museum, let me know in the comment section. Tell me more about it. I would love to know. And here, for instance, is one of the specimens that he brought back to Austria, which is a stingray, as you can see. And here it's another specimen, in this case a fish. This time he drew, he didn't bring it back. And this fish actually has quite a funny name, at least it sounds funny to me, it always cracks me up. He is called Surubin. <laughs> and also, let me know in the comment section below if you also think that Surubin is a very funny sounding <laughs> name. I would love to know that as well, it always cracks me up. So folks, this concludes our video about the Austrian scientific mission, if you will. <laughs> and those of you who have just arrived in this channel and this is the first video you're watching, be sure to like the video, if you did like the video, of course, subscribe to the channel, and most importantly, share this with as many people as you possibly can so that each time more people may know of the wonders of the wonderful city. And as usual in this channel, I'll see you in the next video. Bye!